Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. I'm Arlen Salty, your host and the co-founder of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that is why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After over four decades of holding events throughout the world, we are pulling together some of the best of the best messages from these events. We are here to inspire your day. Okay, let's get started with our next guest. Our guest today is Erwin McManus. Let me tell you a little bit about Erwin. Erwin serves as a lead pastor and cultural architect of Mosaic, which is a radically innovative church in Los Angeles. He's a founder of Global Impact, and Erwin speaks on globalization, leadership, cultural transformation, postmodernism, and church growth. He partners with Bethel Theological Seminary as a distinguished professor and futurist. He is a contributing editor for Leadership Journal, and he has authored multiple books, including Gold Medallion Finalist, An Unstoppable Force. Here is Erwin McManus. About six years ago, I, I stopped writing books. Some of you may not even know that I'm a writer, but I used to be a writer. I used to write books, and, and I, I wrote in the space of creativity and spirituality. And somewhere along the way, I, I started feeling disillusioned with what I was watching in the world around me and in my own world inside of me. I don't know if you've ever been in that kind of space. And I, I sat down with my wife, and I, and I said, hey, honey, I think I need to make a, a career shift. I always worked in various careers along the way, but people kind of knew me for, for being a pastor and starting this church in LA called Mosaic. And, and so I said, I, I want to be an artist for the next 20 years, and I just want to create beautiful things. And she said, sure, go ahead. And then about a year later, I was working in the film industry, in the, in the fashion industry, and my wife, Kim, said, do we need to talk? It seems like you have another life that I don't know about. And I said, what are you talking about? She goes, well, it seems like you're no longer like pastoring and now you're a fashion designer or filmmaker and we need to talk. And, and I said, well, we have talked. And she goes, no, we haven't. And I said, yes, we did it a year ago. Remember, I sat down and I said I wanted to be an artist for the next 20 years. And, and she said, that doesn't count because I didn't think you could be successful. And so now well, we need to talk again. And some of it was me trying to figure out what was going on inside of my own soul. Because somehow the pieces in my life were not fitting together the way that I thought they would. Which is hard when you believe in Jesus with every aspect of your being, and, and yet you, you feel like something's not right inside of you. So in the mix of that, this friend of mine who's like a scientist artist, and he's one of those people that you despise, he's kind of good at everything, he came up to me and told me about this community called TED. Have you ever heard of TED? It stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. And he said, you need to figure out how to get into TED. And I'd never heard of it, but I started listening and paying attention to it. It was before there were TED Talks. It was like a private community, and you could only hear these talks if you were inside of that community. And you had to apply. And so I applied to be a member of TED, and, and I discovered very quickly you actually have to be qualified. You have to be good at something. And, and so they did not accept me. They, they rejected me kindly, and but, but I applied again, and they said no again, and then I applied again, and they said no again, and I was okay with that. See, I, I could deal with that, because I used to date, and so I know what a rejection is like, and, you know, and you, you just know the line between persistence and stalker, and, and so I, I, I just kept applying and asking, and they just kept saying no, and then finally I heard about this, this TED they were going to have, and it was called TED Global, and it was going to be in Arusha, Tanzania. I'd never been to Arusha, Tanzania. I knew it was in Africa, and I thought to myself, I'll bet you very few people actually go to Tanzania. I thought, I'll bet you fewer people will apply to TED in Tanzania. I think that if I apply to TED in Tanzania, that I might get in just because they don't have enough applicants. You see, because you may not know this, because my name is Erwin McManus, so it's German and Irish, but I'm not German or Irish. I'm Spanish. I'm a Latino. I, I'm from El Salvador. Spanish was my first language. And, and if you know anything about Latinos, that you see, you can lock the front door, but we'll just walk around and find a window. And, and so I, 
I thought, this is the Ted window. They locked the front door, but this is the Ted window. So I'm going to go around and jimmy the window and see if I can get in the Ted. And so I applied to Ted Global and I got in. And so I was so excited because I knew they didn't have enough applicants. And, and I thought, okay, now I, I, I'm in, but I have to get to Africa, which is a little harder. It's a long way to go to go to this experience. So I, I found a way. I went to South Africa. Then I flew to Arusha, Tanzania. Then there I was at my first TED. And I was terrified because these are the, the leading thinkers in the world. They're the leading experts in the world of technology, entertainment, design, artistry, uh, philanthropy, social endeavor, social justice. I mean, you name the arena and they bring the best of the best. And I, I knew I didn't belong there, but I didn't care, I wanted to be there. And there were about 500 people there. And, and I, I, one of the things that's kind of difficult for me is that even though I'm on a platform a lot, I'm actually an incredibly awkward social introvert. I, I get terrified in crowds. In fact, I almost feel like social anxiety disorder comes and consumes me when, I, in, when I'm in a room with too many people. I, I don't know if you can relate to that, but it's a terrifying thing. And so I, I'm walking into this room at TED, and I have one of my kids on the phone. I have a son named Aaron, a daughter named Mariah, and, and they're walking me through because they know I'm terrible in groups. And they go, Dad, do not just go stand in the corner. Walk toward people. And I go, I am. And they were coaching me. Dad, look at people. Make eye contact. Dad, smile. Dad, smile. How do you know I'm not smiling? Smile. Don't yell. You look crazy. And, and they said, look for someone who looks like they need a friend more than you. And I, thank you so much. Thank you. I love my kids. They make me feel so affirmed. And, and I thought, no, no. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the kindest person in the room. Because the kindest person in the room will probably have compassion on me. And I saw this woman. She was a little older than me. And, and everyone else seemed younger. And so I, she got in the buffet line and she was by herself. So I thought, I think, she, I think she'll talk to me. And so I got in line behind her and, and I said, hi, I, I'm Erwin. And she told me her name. And I said, this is my first TED. And she told me her experience. And, 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 and then I, and I said, hey, um, I, I don't have anyone to eat lunch with. Do you want to eat lunch together? She said, that'd be great. She was so kind. I was right. She had kind eyes. And we sat down at this table that would seat like 10 people, and, and, and we sat down together, and in a matter of minutes, eight other people sat down with us. And I thought, wow, the, the 10 people are so friendly. They just came right to sit with us. And for the next hour, me and her just talked back and forth, had this great conversation, but no one else interrupted, inter interrupted us, at, us at all. They just listened in to me and her talking, and I thought, wow, I am so interesting. And, and, but they, they never said a word, but it wasn't really me they were listening to, they were listening to her, except for one thing. I mean, she was awesome, except, you ever talk to someone that no matter what you talk about, they just want to talk about whatever they want to talk about? You know what I'm talking about? You know, you, you want to talk about the weather, and they want to talk about, like, you know, hockey. And you want to talk about your relationship, it's not going where it needs to go, and they go, yeah, yeah, our hockey team isn't going where it needs to go. And you ever talk, about, you ever talk to someone like that, and the matter you talk about politics, you're back to hockey. You know, my, I don't know, I, my, uh, my marriage is going well, I know. Hockey isn't going well either, and they just keep going back. Well, she was like that. No matter what I talked about, she'd always just go back. I, 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 she asked me, well, what, what are some of your issues of concern? And I said, well, I think the geopolitical situation in China is really important. And she goes, you know, chimpanzees have geopolitical you know, dynamics. Said, really? And, and then a little while later, I'm talking about relationships. She goes, you know, chimpanzees have relational systems too. And no matter what I talked about, she just kept talking about chimpanzees. And I thought, what is her fixation with chimp chimpanzees? I, I, I didn't know anyone who knew so many. And so after about an hour, I looked at her and I said, Jane, can I ask you a question? And <laughs> now she's not the Jane of Tarzan and Jane. She, she, I said, are, are you Jane Goodall? And she said, of course I am. And I said, oh, that explains the whole like chimpanzee thing. It makes all the sense in, in the world. And, and I'm telling you, this is what happened to me. See, because she was like, she was like the lady. She was a chimpanzee lady. And, and every time I ate with someone, they were the expert. They were the person who marched with penguins. There's someone who studied a particular bee migrating from Central America in the month of October. I mean, these people all had a species studying one flower that brought the cure to some huge disease. And then they would eventually ask me, so what do you do? And I hated that question because I, 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 I do a lot of things. I, I, I've done a lot of things, but, but I've never really done anything well. And, and, and I didn't want to say I'm a pastor because it, one of the things about the community there is that most of the people there would not be necessarily Christian friendly. They may be dominantly atheists. 
And so if I said, hi, I'm a pastor, it would be like saying, hi, I'm a cannibal. Do you want to have lunch? And, and so I thought, I, I shouldn't say that. And so I would play around with different things I've done. And finally, I would just say this. I, I've done a lot of things, but, but nothing well. And then they would always respond, oh, you're a writer. And I thought, oh, that's what writers do. They do a lot of things, but nothing well. That's why we write, because if we were good at it, we would just do it. But we realized we're not good at it, so we're going to write about it. And that way we look like we're good at it, but at a distance. And and, and now I'm, I'm like a Tedster. I'm like a, I'm a Ted addict. I've been to like 10, 12 Teds around the world. And, and my wife's like, how many more of these do you need? And I said, what do, you, what do you mean? She goes, I mean, you've been to so many now. I mean, how many more do you need? And I said, that's like asking a cocaine addict, how many more does he need? It's just a silly question, more. And, and, but I went home one day and I, and, I, and I was getting ready for the next experience. I said, honey, I, I don't know if I can go back. She said, well, I, said I, I need a species. Like, I, I, just, I can't go back there without a species. They all bring one. They all have a species, and I don't have a species, and I, 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 I feel, you know, undermanned. And, and so I started thinking, is there a species that I've been watching? I mean, we're not good with pets, so I, I can't really pick one of those. And, and then it hit me. My favorite species in the world are humans. I love humans. I mean, I, 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 I've been a human almost all of my life, and I, I, I enjoy humans. I have endless human interactions. Watching humans from a distance is one of the most enjoyable things in the world. And I thought to myself, what makes humans different than every other species? What, what, what is it that makes you different than a chimpanzee? What, what makes you different than a porpoise? What makes you different than a spider or a beetle? or a giraffe, or a zebra? What makes you distinctly human? And I want to take a few moments and talk to you about what it means to be you. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, there are some verses that I know you've heard maybe a thousand times over again, and I want you to hear them today with a fresh perspective. Let your soul be open. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, I know you've heard those words before. But have you ever read a section of the Bible and you pretended it made sense because it was in the Bible, but it didn't really make any sense at all? No. See, I think you have. And I think this is one of those passages. I mean, think about it just for a moment. It begins by saying, now faith is confidence in what we hope for. I'm going, well, I don't know if that's true. I mean, that's not how I experience life. I have more confidence in what I have than what I hope for. How about you? See, as a human being, I have far more confidence in what I have than what I hope for. And so if, I, if, I, if you have a girlfriend, you have more confidence that you have a girlfriend than if you don't have one, and you're hoping. See, when you hope for one, it's not, it doesn't give you as much confidence as when you have one. If you have a job, you have a lot more confidence than if you just hope you get a job. See, the reality is somehow faith shifts this thing because we naturally have more confidence in what we have than what we hope for. And in fact, it goes on to say, an assurance about what we do not see. Now, I don't know about you, but I have more assurance in what I see than what I don't see. That seems like to, to be my stat, natural state of being. And so if I have something, I have more assurance that it exists than if I don't have something. So let's say, like this chair. If you came and brought two chairs, one chair I could see and one chair I could not see, and you say, which chair would you like? I'd say, I think I have assurance in the chair I see. You can have the other one. Because you seem to be pretty sure it's there. See, and the problem here is that God is actually talking to us about what it means to be human. 
And it's in the space called faith. Is it possible that faith returns us to our natural state of existence? That actually without faith, we're living a life that makes us more like all the other animals and less like the one created in the image and likeness of God. Imagine what would happen if we began to have a life where we had confidence in what we do not see and assurance for what we hope for. Far more confidence in what we do not have than what we have, what we hope for than what we have, and far more assurance in what cannot be seen than what we see. Because when that would happen, we would become creatures of the future rather than the past. Because hope always exists in the future. Hope never exists in the past. Whenever you hope for something to change in the past, that's called regret. Hope always leans you forward. See, when you have assurance in what you see, you are trapped in the material world. You're trapped in the present. You're trapped in the past. But when you have assurance in what cannot be seen, you will now lean into the mysterious, uncertain future, and you become a creature of the future. Is it possible that you and I, that we humans designed in the image of and likeness of God are actually created to work in the invisible material. But because we've disconnected from God, we've trapped ourselves and limited ourselves to work only with the visible material. Let us go just a little farther. Father, he goes, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And right before that, he says, this is what the ancients were commended for. What were the ancients commended for? We just skip right over that. We don't know. What were the ancients commended for? Maybe they were commended for living life the way they were created to live it. And faith restores that. Because this next part is strange. Why, do we, why should we care about the universe being formed at God's command suddenly? Why is he telling us so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible? Now, science tells us, and I love science, but science tells us that everything comes out of something, right? Except for the original something that came out of nothing, which, of course, is difficult. And, but what science shows us empirically is that everything comes out of something, and so we can know that everything comes out of something except that original something that comes out of nothing, which is sort of like the Big Bang. But what people of faith say is that everything came out of something and that something came out of nothing. It sounds like the same thing except that nothing came from God. Except that's not what the Bible says. The scriptures actually say something very different. What the scriptures tell us is that it looks like everything came out of something and something came out of nothing, but it really didn't come out of nothing. It came out of something else. That's what it's saying. See, look again. So that was seen was not made out of what was visible. It doesn't say what is seen came out of nothing. It says what is seen came out of the unseen. What the scriptures are actually telling us is everything that exists, everything that is visible, everything that is seen did not come out of nothing. It came out of the invisible. And it was materialized into the visible. That everything that is seen came out of that which is not visible. And so it looks like everything came out of something and something came out of nothing, but actually everything came out of something and something came out of something else, but that something else was invisible and it created that which was visible. It can be very confusing. So what are the scriptures telling us? What was that invisible material? See, the invisible material from which everything visible came was the mind of God, an idea, a thought, a dream. See, God saw it and then spoke it and then created it. Now, here's the crazy thing. You are designed by God in the same way. You see, humans are materializers of the invisible. Now, let that sink in just for a minute because it's going to make a difference. I want to change your view of what it means to be human. Because we talk a lot about God, but we don't talk enough about how God created us. See, humans are materializers of the invisible. See, the invisible, you ever, you ever had an idea? Have you ever had an idea? Anybody? 
Have you ever had a thought, a dream, a vision? You thought, I can do this. This can be created. This can happen. And in fact, if you ever shared your idea with someone, they said you're out of your mind, that'll never happen. See, humans are created, designed by God to live in this invisible space called dreams and visions, ideas, thoughts. And when we have that invisible material of an idea, when you find the courage and the resolve, the skill and the discipline, and you step into that, when you have the faith to take the invisible that's in a dream or a vision and translate that into life, you've taken the invisible and turned it into the visible. See, actually, every human being can do this. You can have an idea and then make it a reality. I don't know, some of you may not realize this, but we didn't always have cell phones. I know, it's hard to imagine that, a world so primitive. But someone had the idea of a cell phone and it was created. Uh, you may not realize this, but we didn't always have the internet. And someone had the idea and the internet was created. Some may not know this, but we didn't always have cars, but someone imagined it. And now we have them. We didn't have planes and submarines. It was an idea that was materialized into a reality. I, I love this one very, very obscure passage in Genesis chapter 4. In, in verses 20 through 22, listen real carefully. It's a genealogy, which are always so exciting. It says, Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who played stringed instruments and pipes. Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. I, I love this because... We have three individuals, Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal Cain. Three very popular names in the States. And, and they were the very first. See, it tells us that Jabal was the father of those who lived in tents and raised livestock. You see, before Jabal, no one ever lived in a tent. A tent didn't even exist. No one ever thought of the idea of livestock. So they just wandered through the prairies, through the forests. And that was a great life except when it was pouring down rain or snowing. And then you'd have to find a cave and you hope there wasn't a bear there. And it, so you'd send people you didn't like in there first. And then if it was empty, everyone else went in. And Jabal thought to himself, I'm so sick and tired of getting wet when I'm walking across the prairie. I think I'm gonna create a mobile cave. And so he took the skins of animals most likely and created this mobile cave called the tent. Can you imagine how popular Jabal was? He, he may not have been the best looking guy, but I'm telling you, he had all the girls when he had the only tent. See, maybe when it was sunny, they went after someone else, that, you know, the guy with the bronze iron. And you know, like Jabal, he's like the strange guy with this like dome thing. But when it started pouring down rain and he said, ladies, would you like to have dinner at my place? He became very, very popular because he's the only one who stayed dry. Everyone else went hunting every day. Maybe he didn't like getting up in the morning. I'm not a morning person. I'm tired of hunting because hunting sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab some of these less inspired animals that don't want to run. Cattle, sheep. They, they don't seem to be that eager to, to, to live. And, 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 and so he brought them together and began to domesticate them. And he created the first livestock. Before Jabal, there were no tents and no livestock. But after that, you couldn't imagine a world without it. Because first it was an idea in the invisible, in his mind, in his brain, in his dreams. And he translated that into reality. Then there's his brother, Jubal. Now I can imagine once Jabal was the most popular guy, because he had a tent and livestock, Jubal might have thought, I need to do something. I need to make my mark. And so it tells us that Jubal, which you probably know, was the father who played all stringed instruments and pipes. Can you imagine that before Jubal, there was never a guitar? There was never a violin, there was never a cello, there was never a flute or a piccolo. Before Jubal, there were never any instruments. But he was the first one to invent stringed instruments. How do you do that? Because, you know, the original string instruments were made out of cat gut. I mean, how do you decide to work with cat gut? I, I mean, maybe a herd of buffalo went by when they were hunting and... And this cat was just a little slower. He should have gone left, but he verged, he verged you know, right and <laughs> buffalo, <laughs> cat, gut. And all the other humans just went right by it, not even looking down. But Jubal was kind of curious. He goes, mm, I can work with this. 
And eventually he started doom, 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 working with the cat guy, going, look, look, look what I can do. And he might have seemed a little psychotic, but little by little, as he carved out pieces of wood and created the first harp or the first guitar, he became the most popular. Can you imagine how good looking he became when he was the first? When he was the first? And, um, and there he was, the first Tim Hughes. Good looking, playing that melodic sound. He had no problems getting those sweet girls out of that tent to come and get to know him. <laughs> he was the first one to create pipes. Do you realize that what Jubal did is he captured the wind and gave it voice? I mean, how did he think of that? Maybe he was walking through the woods and there were some dead branches and the wind was blowing through them and he could hear the whistle. And he realized, I think I can work with this. See, they're in the scriptures because before they lived, what they imagined did not exist. But after they lived, what they imagined changed the future of humanity. And I want you to know that's the way God's designed you. You are a materializer of the invisible. Isn't it interesting that the scriptures tell us that this movement of Jesus is going to be a movement of dreamers and visionaries? That young men and old men will have dreams and visions. Is it possible what God is telling us is that he is restoring our original state of being? That we are to be the materializers of the invisible. That God imagines a future we could never see. But if we allow him to meet us in our imagination, he will show us the world we can create when we move in his power and in his presence. What would faith do then? See, the way that bees create hives and ants create colonies, humans create futures. Because God created you to do what no other species can do, to imagine and see what God has on his heart, and then to translate that into reality. I was always struck by Elijah I just the way he's described as a person just like you and me, James says it like this in chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Have you ever been so connected to God you're not sure if you're praying and asking God, or you're listening and he's telling you? See, I think that's the way it's supposed to be. I think we're supposed to live in such a connected relationship with God that he just keeps whispering to us the future he wants to usher in. And we begin to allow him to make us the instruments to create that future. And I love the fact that it says Elijah was a human being, just like you and me. He was no different than us. He wasn't in a different category. And he prayed and had a conversation with God, and it did not rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and it started to rain. It's just that simple. You don't really need to expand that story. But if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 18, this is the detail in verses 41 through 46. It says this, And Elijah said to Ahab, Go, eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand, a cloud as small as a fist, is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds and the wind rose and the heavy rain started falling and they have rode off to Jezreel and the power of the Lord came on Elijah and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. I love the subtlety of this moment. Elijah says to Ahab, go and eat and drink for there is the sound of a heavy rain. But then he sits down and puts his head between his legs and he says to his servant, go to the sea and tell me what you see. And he comes back and he says, nothing. 
He goes, you don't see anything, nothing. So he goes, go back again, and goes to the sea, looks around, and clear sky. Comes back, says, nothing. Third time, nothing. Fourth time, nothing. Can you imagine if you're like a, the closest person to Elijah and he keeps going, go back to the sea. I, I, I hear the sound of a heavy rain. And he's going, yeah, yeah. Nothing. About time six, you wouldn't really want to come back. You, 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 maybe you want to go, well, you know, there the, the could have been something. You know, if I, when I squinted just right, there they was like, no, nothing. And, and Elijah just kept sending him back and sending him back and sending him back. But I love that Elijah didn't say, I think rain is coming. He, he didn't say, I believe rain is coming. He, he didn't say, I've prayed for rain to come. You know what he said? I hear the sound of a heavy rain. It's as if Elijah was already living in the moments yet to come, coming from the future into the presence to speak what God was about to do. I hear the sound of a heavy rain. And that seventh time when the servant came back and said, there's a cloud the size of a fist, Elijah said, go and tell them the storms are coming. I want you to know something if you listen carefully enough, if you pay attention, if you allow yourself to connect to Jesus in the most intimate of ways, you will begin to hear the sounds of the future coming and God will use you as the instrument to bring that into reality because you are created in the image and likeness of God and you are a materializer of the invisible. That is what it means to live by faith, no longer trapped in the past, no longer stuck in the present, but creating the future that only God can imagine. I can tell you, I've heard the sound of a heavy rain and I'm going mad. I've heard God speak so deeply inside of my soul and it's time It's time for us to take the Bible back from those who turned it into a manuscript of conformity and reclaim it as our manifesto of creativity. I am absolutely convinced that this is the moment the church is going to stop being the last remnant holding on to the past and we will become the creators of the future. It is time for us to become the epicenter of imagination and creativity, of courage and faith. It is time for us to realize that God is an extraordinary God who created us in his image and likeness. It is time for us to understand that we are not like gazelles. We are not like zebras. We are not like chimpanzees. We are not like porpoises. We are created in the image of God and we are created by him to materialize the invisible. So what do you see? What do you hear that will so consume you that you must rise up and go and create? God bless. What a powerful message from Irwin. What an incredible challenge for each of us and the entire church to be involved in sharing the creativity of God with a world that needs to see the invisible. If you would like to learn more about Irwin McManus, go to irwinmcmanus.com. We are so grateful for you and for every one of our listeners around the world. We also want to remind you of an incredible treasure available to you for free. Yes, for free. If you'd like access to hundreds of hours of training from some of the top Christian authors, teachers, and thought leaders in the world, just head on over to BreakforthOnline.com. That's BreakforthOnline.com. When you're there, just sign up for a free membership to Break Forth Online, and you'll have access to hundreds of hours of free online training in everything from relationships to spiritual renewal to leadership and far more. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our upcoming live events, as well as our tours to the lands of the Bible for spiritual journeys of a lifetime. Thank you again for listening. Please subscribe, rate this podcast, and come back soon where we will have more words of inspiration waiting for you on Break Forth Fully Alive.